Okay, folks, uh, this is welcome to the Hortonworks uh, Future of Data Meetup. Uh, so our meetup is going to get started in about 10 minutes. Uh, there's a few folks still in the lobby. Uh, hopefully folks can hear me. Uh, so it'll be about 10 minutes before we get started. So thanks.
Okay. Okay, folks, uh, welcome to the Future Data Meetup. Thanks for coming out. Uh, I know it's been uh, hot, and uh, you know we've been waiting in this you know, hot room over here, but so thank you very much for coming out. Uh, so our topic tonight is uh, building a streaming application in uh, 10 minutes or less. How's that, <laughs> how's that for a challenge, Harsha? Yeah. Um, and so the, the agenda is, um, we're gonna switch out the agenda a little bit. We're gonna start uh, with uh, Streaming Analytics Manager, an introduction, then talk about Schema Registry, then, then actually go through a use case. Uh, so we'll have uh, two speakers, uh, Harsha and, and Edgar. So Harsha is going to start it off with us, and then we'll we'll go from there. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Are your mics on? Uh, mic on? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm free Harsha. Let me switch the slides first. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, we are working on two new uh, open source projects. One is called Stream Analytics Manager, SAM for short, and Registry. Uh, we just open released it uh, in a GA couple of weeks back. So we are very excited about these two things. So before going further into like uh, what are these two new projects that we are doing, let me give you some of the background of what's uh, with the streaming at HaronWorks. Uh, we started as Storm as uh, our Steam Processing Engine back in 2013. Later we added Kafka as kind of our uh, messaging queue as well into the offering. So we had an opportunity to work with our community as well as our users for the last three years. And we improved Storm, Storm 1.1 release has 16x performance improvements. It has SQL interface so that you can actually write a select like query to express your topologies, Nimbus HA, uh, Blob Store, security, whatnot. And also we worked with Apache Kafka community to ship the security. Uh, that's the major contribution that we did to Kafka as well as a lot of uh, features in terms of token-based authentication, uh, reliability in delivery and whatnot. So what we had this is for three years, we are working closely with our customers as well as the community and try to understand what are the pitfalls of developing a, a streaming application? What are the pain points? Um, how they are actually building, like writing the code as well as productionizing, right? You know, how do you do as, And also uh, kind of what are you doing with the data once you're processing it? So are you going to keep it in like a writing it to HDFS and using traditional tool to run or how are you consuming this data? So this gave us a lot of opportunities to learn from them and kind of you know put our vision in, in, into place into these two projects, kind of derive what is the next gen stream and streaming analytics platform will look like. So that is out of that vision and out of that need is prone uh, both registry as well as SAM. <laughs> okay, so before going further into, uh, okay, great. <laughs> before f going further into like how to develop an application under 10 minutes, I want to give the foundational piece that makes it possible, that is schema registry. So what is schema registry? A schema registry is a central location where you store a general schema text to, to enable uh, your producers and consumers, your streaming applications or whatnot. So what it does, it enables you to kind of reuse the existing schemas for across different use cases, and kind of you can define relationship between the schemas. For example, as an organization, you want to define a date format should look like this, kind of enforce that across all the use cases, of all the data, you can actually put that in place in a single place, and everyone can actually consume from that. Uh, we are not just looking at one uh, format that is, you know, just use Avro, uh, just use Protobuf. We are making that as a flexible. That is, you can use um, Avro if you like that, or Protobuf, or if you have your own proprietary format, you can actually use that uh, in the schema registry context. Uh, operational efficiency, that is, you don't need to carry the, the schema with every piece of data that is going through in your organization. So you can define at the central place, you kind of make a pointer to that, and you, you know, everyone kind of actually gets that schema when, when they're running in uh, during the runtime. And uh, the most important aspect is producers and consumers can evolve independently. That is, not just in context of Kafka, but anyone ingesting data into, let's say, Kinesis, Kafka, or, or Hive table, or whatnot, can produce their version of data, and consumers can actually stick to a version that they would like to, 
and keep reading the data, as long as the data is backward compatible or whatnot. So why schema registry? So typically uh, you have, uh, in a general ingestion use cases, you have a uh, messaging queue such as Kafka, Kinesis, or even Hub. So producer right now, writing the data, kind of converts the data into a byte payload. Kafka stores the data into a byte payload onto the disk, as well as then the consumer will get the byte payload again. So the understanding of that bytes, what that means, if it is a user ID has it, or if it is an address or whatnot, is that code, the entire logic of that is actually exists in the consumer side or on the producer side. For example, you're pushing a JSON payload, right, and it has a user ID, um, department ID, and address. How you are parsing it is actually on the consumer side. And whenever producer changes any data type or whatnot, or add a new field, you kind of have to sit with them to try to understand what's the data that they changed and put that logic again in your code. So it's a lot of setups that's going up and down. So what we are trying to do is kind of take away that pain point and register the schema and the schema registry can evolve independently without having to kind of talk to each other or without having to put that logic into the code itself. So how are we going to do about that? So before I go into architecture or the flow diagram, I'm gonna give you a little bit of concepts. Schema group, again, as we said, this is a schema registry for Kafka or Kinesis. It is for pretty much entire data that is moving. So schema group defines uh, the schemas related to a logical container. For example, you in your organization, you're using Kafka, you can group a bunch of schemas together as a group, Kafka, and you are also using HDFS, and you can group all those schemas as using HDFS. Now, schema metadata, uh, metadata is associated with the schema itself. For example, you are registering a schema for um, orders, and this is the data that is flowing through Kafka. Then you can schema meta Kafka topic, for example. Metadata can contain the name of the topic uh, where the data actually exists, right? And any other description, tags, or whatnot. Now, underneath this project, uh, underneath this entity is the versioned entity. Think of like a Git, uh, so everything is versioned. That schema version is actual schema text. For example, if you're using Avro, that will be where it gets stored. And you can independently evolve that as you add new fields, remove new fields or whatnot. You can, we are versioning that schema for every time you create one. Uh, is how the interaction will look like. Um, that is your schema registry, it's a simple uh, web server talking to a pluggable schema storage where your actual schema text gets stored. Uh, again, right now we have uh, support for MySQL, Postgres, and in-memory. And I'll go a little more about uh, what is the Saturday JAR storage in the later slides. But in chart, you are using a schema registry client that we develop in your project. It kind of will wrap around all your HTTP calls. It makes a uh, job easier for you. So it will take the responsibility of uh, registering a schema as well as consuming a schema. Also, it will actually pull up your Saturdays and serialize and deserialize accordingly. Before I go here, so. So I want to talk about this in general. So this is how the interaction will look like. So you have schema registry, again, it's an HA availability right now. Sender could be your Kafka producer, right? And for example, in Kafka producer, there is a serializer interface you hook into schema registry client, and it will talk to schema registry on what topic you're trying to produce on. If there is already a schema register with that, it will fetch the schema and serialize based on what the schema defines and convert that into a byte payload and write into Kafka, which could be your you know, message store. On the receiver side, you can actually stick to a version. Again, um, as a producer evolving, you want to kind of on the consumer side, want to have a predictability of which version you want to deserialize on. So that's what receiver does. Again, the, if you take the example of Kafka consumer, uh, you have a deserializer interface which can hook into schema registry client. Again, which can talk to uh, schema registry to get the schema text itself and deserialize and give the job object back to you. So uh, before going into that, we want to define the compatibility policies as well. So in case of Avro, we provide backward, forward, both, none. So what that means is when you first come to the schema registry, you register the version one or version zero of the schema, you are setting the compatibility policy at that time. So you could be backward, forward, or none, or full. 
So let's say if you choose backward compatibility, from then on, any new versions of the schema that are getting registered will be enforced based on that com compatibility policy that you set at the beginning. That means any user who is trying to register a new version will be checked against the policy. And if it doesn't, it's not compatible, we're going to throw an error back and won't register that schema. So what it does allow you to is gives you an expected uh, policy around that schema so that consumers can know if I'm subscribing to this particular topic with this schema, which is backward compatible, that means I can stick to V0 no matter what the new producer will do. So that you continue to do operation without having to do kind of, you know, take down or whatnot, or have a uh, production issues or whatnot. So let's talk about the backward compatibility policy. So this is our V1 version of the schema. So we have two uh, fields, ID and name. Now the, another producer comes in, I say uh, he wants to add a new field called pages. So when you are registering this one in a backward compatible mode, you need to pass a default value. So what happens is in consumer side, when they're sticking to V1, they've, when, they, when they're sticking to V1 schema, if the data is encoded by the V2, they'll get the default value. So, so they don't have any, like in the runtime, they don't have any issues with that, right? Forward compatibility is kind of inverse of what backward in a way. Uh, so if the consumer is stick to V2, which is expecting the pages end, but if you still have the data that is being sent by V1, it will just drop the, the field name pages and gives back the, new, uh, the older data. Backward and, and both uh, are a full compatibility. It's like backward and uh, forward combination. And the last one is the non-compatibility where you know, you're just in a free for, you're just registering the schemas. We're not enforcing any compatible policy. We're not going to throw any errors. It's up to the users how they are to interact with that. This we talked about. Now, sorry, go ahead. In case of forward, or sorry. Okay, let me try. So, what happens if you drop the mandatory field in case of when you are enforcing uh, the policy in case of an older client? So, but there is no actually a mandatory field in this case. When you pass default, it's not a mandatory field because that can be substituted by the default value. So, we're not essentially dropping the the field itself. We're passing. We're putting the default value and giving it to the it to the consumer. Consumer, because it's using the, the older serializer, the object that it runs will not have that field. But the data has that field. Consumer's point of view, uh, let's say if you have, um, uh, again, a user record which has first name, last name, and address, and you added a new field called zip code, uh, if the consumer is in the older schema, let's say V0, which is expecting the first three fields, first name, last name, zip code, it still get those three fields. The zip code itself is not visible to that. Because their business logic on those three fields, it's not aware of the fourth field that you added, it's still fine to continue with that. They updated their version of the, the code, right? Or you know, they updated the schema version that they want to use. Does it make sense? Yeah, sure. But do you expect the default to be supplied? By the user, yeah. So in our use case especially, so if default, it's a mandatory field, right? So if uh, then that means it's not a backward compatible uh, schema. So you are breaking the compatibility policy. So at the time when you're defining the schema, you are kind of setting this to be a backward compatible. So if you're not passing a default value for a field, that means you're breaking the compatibility policy. So we don't even let them register the schema itself. Yeah, at the beginning itself, the automated way, so there is two ways to kind of register the schemas right now. You can go to the UI, or you can just pass the schema text to your schema registry client. It will go and uh, register the schema for you. In both cases, there is an appropriate error thrown back to the user. Uh, so coming to the earlier point that we want to make the format uh, not just stick to the Avro or whatever the format that we like, but we want the users to kind of have the ability to define their own format, or uh, have a you know proprietary format or what. So that's where the the uh, pluggable serializers, deserializers comes into play. So if you're using Avro, you can just depend on the Avro Sardis. But if you're using your own format, you can define, extend our interfaces to define your serializers and deserializers. So we have like three uh, different 
uh, interfaces. The first one is a snapshot, which is you have a small amount of document, you just give the document to the parser, it will give back the object back. Uh, the other one is kind of event-based. Uh, so if you have a really long document and you have a records within it and you have a record boundary, you want to kind of, every time you pass a record, you want to kind of give back to the, 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 the parent class. So that's where the pull base and push base deserializer interfaces will come into play. <coughs> so a little bit of schema still client is again REST based client. Um, this is Java right now. Uh, we are working on a Python based client as well. Uh, caching. So it does heavy, so schemas are immutable. So we can heavily cache on the client side itself. So we cache the metadata schema versions. And if you're using a pluggable uh, service, we're going to fetch those on the fly and cache it on the register client itself. Uh, I'm going to talk about URL selector a little bit later. Uh, that's after the SHA. So we support SHA in two formats. One is we expect the, the one option is to use the storage as a transactional DB. And we expect the DB to be HA, and you can just spin up registry servers just as a regular web servers, right? And if you don't want to use a, like a MySQL or Postgres, you want to have your own different storage, you can do so, and you can use HA with a Zookeeper. In that case, there, is we, there will be one master. All the writes goes to that master, and reads can go to any slaves, right? And URL selectors, with that in respect to, if you have multiple schema registry clients, think of if you have looked at Kafka, it's like a bootstrap servers. You give a bunch of servers uh, listings in the, URL, in, the, in the configuration, and we're going to go through round robin uh, fashion to you know, hit one of the servers to get the data. So far, the integration of schema registry has been with the Kafka, NiFi, as Sam that I'm going to talk about, as well as Storm. So we are working on other communities to kind of uh, you know, get this in integration into other products as well. So it's the same uh, integration that I talked about earlier, but with the Kafka in context. So same uh, with the producer and the consumer. So let me go quickly give a demo of this. So this is the UI currently we are um, actively working on kind of improving. I'm going to talk about the roadmap and the UI improvements that are coming in our way. So we already have a bunch of uh, schemas registers. So if you open up, this is the Avro schema that we added. So you can keep adding uh, new schemas, increment the versions itself. So let's look at in context of a Kafka example. I don't know if anybody can see that at the bottom of the screen. So I'm just creating a new topic called elp underscore reviews. So I'm going to ingest uh, elp reviews data and uh, using schema registry, right? So I'm creating a topic. Okay, we just create the topic now. So I already have an example code uh, which we already in registry. This is a typical Kafka producer properties. Um, my topic is elp reviews, uh, bootstrap servers. And here the schema is the URL. This is the URL that actually the schema is client will take in. So in my example, I added my dependency from schema is client from Maven. So I already built that. And key serializer, again, I'm defaulting to, <coughs> you can also have a key schemas in the schema registry. For now, for this, I'm going to go with a simple string serializer. On this side, I'm using the, Kafka, the schema registry's Kafka Avro serializer. So Kafka Avro serializer, when the data comes in, it takes the data, first makes a call into schema registry client to check if there is any schema for help underscore reviews. In our case, right now, there is no, this another topic, but we don't have exact match of the schema right now, right? So this simple command that I already have, I don't know if you can see that. But I'm passing the, the L preview JSON and also the data Kafka producer props that I just showed it to you, along with a L underscore review um, Avro schema, right? So it produced some data. So now take a look at the, so we just registered the new schema from the Kafka producer itself. It's a schema that I passed and also ingested the data uh, along with by serializing with this particular schema itself. Now on the consumer side, let 
me change this to right. So that's my topic. I want to read from. Again, uh, I'm using the new consumer API, Bootstrap servers, Kimmel is all the same config as the producer side as well. Uh, in this case, on the key deserializer, I'm using a string, and on the value deserializer, I'm using Kafka arrow, right? So I can use the same tool uh, to consume messages. So I'm passing the consumer props. So let me, I don't know if it is really visible, but this is the message that we actually read from the same topic that we ingested. Uh, this is deserialized by the schema registry client. So what it did is actually talk to the schema registry server, get the schema text, and actually deserialize the byte payload that uh, exists in the Kafka. Any questions here? Okay. So, uh, roadmap uh, collaboration. So, we want to add a rich type of collaboration to this uh, flow. For example, right now, when you define a schema, it's immediately available to everyone to consume. But most often than not, you want to have a, a instance where you want to go through some kind of a approval process. That is, you want to publish a schema in a test mode, and then do some testing, uh, get a peer review, and then actually make that as a production av available schema. And also notifications. Uh, as a big organization, you might have multiple teams consuming from your Kafka or other messaging queue, and anyone who's subscribing to the topic, you want to kind of understand how the, uh, the versioning is going on, any new additions being happening. So notification is a way of subscribing to schema, kind of understand any changes that has been happening to schema will send it to you, right? Uh, the third one is audit log. So again, you probably s published a schema that's been in use for an year or so, and later nobody's using that. You want to kind of understand how many people are at any given point using a particular schema. So audit log will provide you at any given point what schema used by which client, etc. cetera. Uh, improved UI. Uh, the other important thing that we are looking at is rich data types. So Avro is good at, or any other schema is good at kind of defining a primitive types as well as, in Avro case, there's a record type as well. But it doesn't tell you how the data should be interpreted. For example, if there's a date, uh, you wouldn't know, in a, in a string format especially, it doesn't tell you what is a date format, right? And how you should validate a SSN. Uh, like, for example, you know, how do you want to annotate an SSN? Uh, probably doesn't want to show the data to public or you know do asterisk or whatnot. So these data types kind of another document uh, that sits along with your schema, kind of tells the application how to interpret the data that's being uh, deserialized, right? Operations-wise, cross-cluster mirroring. Um, you probably have you know different colos, and you want to kind of sync the same schemas across different data centers. Uh, Security-wise, we already added. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Kerberos integration, so we are adding SSL as, as well as OAuth 2, and a authorizer, that is, you know, who can uh, view certain schemas, who can access certain schemas or whatnot. In terms of integration, we have a Java client, we are working on a Python as well. Uh, pluggable listeners, uh, you might have a schemas in high meta storage catalog, you want to pull those into schema registry, or other schema registry implementation, pluggable listeners will uh, allow you to do that. And last one is the converters. Uh, most often the data is not expressed in uh, an Avro. For example, the one that we just ingested is in JSON format. And you want to have a kind of a pluggable way of uh, converting a CSV, JSON, or XML into your own format. Uh, that's where the converters will come into play. And you know, this is where you can want to go if you want to read more about the, uh, the project itself. We have docs that are getting updated pretty much every day. Um, this is the repo that is open sourced, access to everyone outside of uh, Hortonworks. Uh, we have a Google Groups where we discuss uh, what are the new things that we are working on. So, you know, we are working on Apache incubation. Uh, we're looking for more contributions. So if you are interested in contributing or have any questions, please reach out to us. Uh, post a question on the registry. We'll be happy to help you. So uh, at this point, I'll take the questions before I go into the SAM itself. So. So, um, okay. 
switch. So the question is, uh, how performant it would be in compared to MM cache day lookup versus what we are doing right now. Uh, so it's just acting as your central storage for the schemas. So the schemas are editable, and the clients are we are caching it as a in memory cache. Okay, so not every message you will go to kind of make a call to schema registry. It's just one time call. Uh, we can set as cache expiry as well. So based, yeah. So we're not like one, once you come up as a producer or a consumer, we make a lookup, and that's pretty much it. And unless you change the version, uh, new version comes up, then only we change, you know, look up again. Uh, but that's a rest call, that's one time call, and everything else is cached. Deployment. How will be the production deployment? Yeah, uh, production deployment would, would, so the question is, um, what is the production deployment uh, recommendation? So we recommend uh, having a machine that is two servers, schema registry client, a schema registry server rather, right? And talking to a MySQL or a Postgres, and there is Oracle as well support. So one of those DBs, that would be the ideal. Most not when you are actually looking at these kind of problems, it's already running. Uh, so, you know, create another database there and use the schema registry servers and have an HA, especially in a production environment. Uh, we're not going to put too much stress again. LinkedIn, the max number of schemas that they have is 10,000. So, essentially, you're looking at at max 10,000 rows plus whatever the version you might have on top of it. So, it's not going to put too much uh, effort on the database itself. Uh, but having an HA means if one of the servers goes down, your clients can still look up and make queries to uh, the server. Cool. So uh, I think this is probably the the, the talk you for uh, stream, streaming on nature. This the the bold claim that we are trying to do. That is, you can write an application within ten minutes under 10 minutes. Uh, I hope we can do that. So uh, where we, the idea behind the stream analytics manager is, uh, you know, most of the users kind of, there are like tens of, or if not, you know, multiple of tens of <laughs> streaming projects that are coming out every other week. Uh, Apache itself might have 10 projects itself. So most often users, when we talk to them, hey, Storm is so old that years. I have this new API that I want to use. Are, you know, I can write a word count application within like three lines of the code. So what we are actually looking at is no matter how many you know, APIs that come about, how much shorter that you can write word count, the real application, writing an application, developing that, and operationalizing is still takes time irrespective of your execution engine. So what we set out to do is to make that development time much easier and get away from this API uh, war that continues to go from project to project. So we develop a visual UI that allows you to kind of drag and drop and build your own components and build an application and deploy that application into a streaming engine of your choice. For the version one, version zero, or whatnot, we developed uh, the runtime execution engine for the Storm. We have plans of integrating other streaming engines as well. So the guiding principle has uh, been build a complex streaming application with no code and also allow users to kind of operationalize that is monitor the application, monitor the critical metrics that are going through, and the most important aspect of it is what are you doing with the data that is being processed in real time, and we have a Druid integration and analytics on top of that, so that user can actually realize the data that is being processed within that minute. Again, uh, the current complexity in the building the streaming application is, again, there are new streaming engines with different APIs. Um, implementing Windows joins, especially with streams, is complicated. Uh, interaction with external services, which is often can be templatized, should be easy for interacting with HBase, Hive, Druid, or whatnot. Deploying with all the necessary configurations. Um, this is especially important, for example, if you're building a top um, application for talking to HBase, you know, you're building a jar, you're running it in either Storm, either Spark, or you know, Flink, whatnot. You need to remember to copy the HBase site HDFS site, core site, all the relevant config files along with that topology jar so that the application clients can know where the name node runs, where the HPS runs, and so on. So that is the most important thing. So we want to make that easier for the user, not to worry about how 
the, the configurations are, where the Kafka servers are running, where the Druid, uh, you know, Zookeeper node is. All of that, we want to make that simplified. And also debugging the streaming applications. Things go wrong in production, and you want to kind of understand which part of you know, problematic, and how do you debug easily. And securing a streaming application cluster. Most often than everyone runs in a secure cluster, so we want to make sure that part of the experience is much more easier than what it's currently doing today. So these are the layers that we are looking at right now. So at the underlying layer, we are looking at distributed computer streaming engine. It could be Storm, Spark, or Flink. On top of that, we have a unified streaming API and a stream builder. That is your visual editor to build your own application. And stream inside, stream inside is our dashboarding utility so that you can actually, you know, look at the data that's being processed in the, in the application. On the, on the other side is the streaming operations to monitor the application itself. So right now, streaming analytics powered by Druid and Super, uh, Power Superset. So we have a Druid connector that you can ingest into. And on top of that, there's a Superset UI that you can actually quickly build a really compelling uh, dashboard on top of that. So before I go off, uh, into architecture or whatnot, I want to give a demo and kind of set the stage on actually doing. So this is kind of the, the landing page of uh, SAM. So you have multiple applications. Some of them are running, some of them are not running. So it kind of gives you a bird's eye view of what's going on in your system. And you want to expose critical metrics of the application, how the latencies are doing or whatnot. So before even doing that, the, as a user, you're first required to kind of import the service itself. So a streaming application will def interact with multiple services. For example, you might be reading from Kafka and you're doing some kind of windowing aggregations, you might be filtering the events, and then you probably want to land that data into HDFS, Hive, or uh, HBase, you know, different applications, right? So what is service pool? Service pool kind of gives you a one-to-one um, -one mapping of your cluster. So here, so my, <coughs> So I'm using Ambari to install my cluster. So I have all of these services that I probably want to interact with in my application. So it's as easy as like going to Streamline here, kind of and you can just click the auto add. It will ask for the credentials. And once you hit enter, it actually goes to the Ambari, talks to the Ambari, like asks for it, what are the services that you are managing? And pulls all the configurations related to that into uh, SAM itself. So in case if you're using, not using uh, Ambari or some other service itself, you can use manual cluster, in which case, like if you're using a puppet or whatnot, you can create your own cluster. And start adding those uh, services, Storm, Kafka, whatnot. So you have, in general, you might have like a you know, Kafka running in a separate cluster and all your other services running in another cluster, right? So you can add multiple of these clusters. Once you have done the service pool, next thing is environments. So each environment is, um, allows you to kind of mix and match different services from different clusters, right? So if I'm writing an application, my interest lies in, okay, I'm gonna read from Kafka, from cluster A, and I'm gonna do some interesting analytics for like window-based aggregation and whatnot. Then I want to store those results back into another cluster of mine, which is running HBase. So you can actually pick and choose, uh, you know, I want Kafka from here, Zookeeper from here, and Storm from here, and another cluster you can add here, and you know, choose HBase, HDFS from there, and define that as your uh, environment, right? So we define, we imported the services, then we defined environment that we are going to use against the application that we are creating. Now the next step is to actually create the application itself. So when you go here, click new application. Here we will ask you to assign a environment with that. So in this case, I'm gonna ask dev, 
Now I'm getting into the topology editor. I have a you know, list of connectors, sources, processors, and sinks itself. Let me drag and drop Kafka. Since we know where the Kafka runs, and I already associated Kafka in my environment, I can actually showcase what is the cluster. And once I select the, the protocol itself, we can actually fill in, auto fill in the, all the configurations for you. So the bootstrap servers is actually picked up from the service pool itself, right? And we also show all the Kafka topics that are running, exist in your cluster right now. So in this case, I'm gonna use, let's say, Alprevs. So once I choose that topic, there is a data, there is a schema associated with it from the schema registry is pulled in. So you have a contextual operations of what's going on with your data. So the, the important thing about uh, once we get away from IDE from into a visualizer like this is to kind of showcase what is the data that you are operating on, what is the data types that it contains. So you as a developer kind of know how are you operating, what kind of aggregation you can apply, and how are you manipulating this data. Let's see, I'm gonna choose for this demo truck events, right? Consumer group ID, again, is typical Kafka consumer group ID. So I define my source, I configure my topic and everything. Now I'm gonna use uh, aggregate. So I'm gonna connect Kafka to aggregate. So as you can see on the right, um, rather left-hand side, uh, there is already input data that's coming in. There's the data that's coming in from the source itself, right? And this is an aggregate window. This is a window-based aggregate window. I'm gonna group uh, based on driver ID, right? A window, in, you know, you can choose time-based window or a count-based window. I'm gonna use count. Again, uh, sliding window, uh, tumbling window up to you. How do you configure the, these two parameters? So timestamp field here. If you want to use like even time-based versus uh, processing time, this is where it will allow you to kind of select one of the fields as your event time. In this case, I'm gonna use the processing time, which means it will use the system time rather than the event time itself, right? Now, I want to kind of calculate miles and, and do a sum of all the miles that are being traveled by a driver ID. So what we are doing is, for every 100 events, we are grouping all the events by the driver ID, and we are applying a UDF called sum to create a you know aggregate of that miles by per driver ID. So as we are constructing this, you can see the output schema getting constructed as well. So this processor is actually took the input and created a new uh, output schema, and you can continue to add different in this case, miles average, and we will construct another column there. And these UDFs, uh, these are built-ins ones. Again, as a user, you might want to write your own UDFs again. So we have an interface, you can upload that, uh, you can build that uh, jar and upload that into SAM, and it will appear as one of the aggregate functions here. So the users can actually apply that, uh, customize that one, right? You hit okay. Now, I want to kind of filter anyone. Uh, so there's a rules processor. I'm gonna connect here. So again, the output of the previous processor, which is the aggregate processor, uh, becomes the input for this one. So the rule processor is kind of a simple filtering processor. Rule one. So here it will show all the fields that are available right now. So I want to kind of see if any one miles greater than 100, I want to execute this rule. So what it does, it will drop every other event that is not, that's not going to satisfy this particular condition. And you can continue to have multiple rules uh, to kind of you know, branch out different filterings. And I have various things here. Um, let me see if I'll use Druid itself. So once we connect, it will ask which rule that we want to apply. I only have one rule here, so I'm gonna use that. Again, uh, as you can see, the Zookeeper connection string and everything is filled, filled up for you. 
because Druid as a service exists in my service pool. It's already part of my environment. So you are picking that configuration and you know, already putting it for the user itself. So these are pretty much uh, standard Druid configurations. I'm going to use processing. Probably I'll just use minute. So that's the application. So what we did is we ingested some data into Kafka topic. We defined the Kafka source, and we are added aggregate, and we are doing two aggregation over a period of or a, over a count of 100 events, which is sum and um, average. Then we filtering the events that are not you know, if the average is less than 100, and we are putting any data that any data that is satisfying that rule into Druid. So essentially, that's the end-to-end -end application that I just built. So, so did anyone time out? Did it, did it take <laughs> 10 minutes? I hope. Yeah, about 10 minutes. About 10 minutes. There is one middle person, and there's one aggregate person. Right? The application should be small, right? Sorry. Don't do it in 10 minutes. If I'm doing 10 minutes, right? Sorry, I, I couldn't right, get it. Yeah. Uh, simple, I mean, I'm talking as well, so I can have, <laughs> can go really fast, and <laughs> well. So this is our crazy application that we usually demo. Uh, mm -hmm. That's another person, so I don't want to get into that. So this is the, um, I can explain about this uh, briefly. So we have uh, pretty much defining two Kafka sources. So I have one topic, uh, Truck events, that is the driver information that's coming in. And that is this particular schema, pretty much. It will tell you driver ID, driver name, and their you know, location as well. And I have another topic that has driver ID, truck ID, route, and the speed itself. And then we have a join. So this will allow you to kind of join two streams based on a window. So we have two streams, Kafka stream one, on the driver ID, we are joining with another Kafka stream, again using the driver ID. So whenever the driver ID of these two topics equal, we will combine that fields together and emit as a one single event out of that. Right? And the next thing is, we are kind of trying to see if there are any, uh, so the data that we are getting is there is a violation events. So if you're going up normal speeds or a speeding there, uh, it will say uh, some event type is not normal. So we're defining a rule, setting that event type, if, if it, event type is not normal, then emit that event out, and then there is event type normal event, right? So for that, again, after that event type, it goes into violation, uh, druid sync, and we are actually further venturing out into different notifications or whatnot. So it's fairly complex application. Uh, so before going there again, let me go and deploy that application. Here's the demo app that we did. So during the deployment, it will ask for like, you know, what are the configurations, how many workers you want to add, how many acres, and what is the parallelisms, etc. So while deploying the application, what we are doing is we are actually bringing all these artifacts together including the configuration. For example, as I said earlier, if you're using HPS, you need to package all the relevant configuration. So all of those coming together and building a, a jar, then getting deployed into the storm runtime right now. Is this affordable? Yes. Yeah. I'll show you once. So the application is deployed. We can go back. Uh, this is the storm view. Let me go to the home. So this is the application that we just developed. It's got deployed onto the storm. So this is the flow from the storm point of view, uh, how it looks like and what we developed right now. So it's going to take a bit of a time uh, to start consuming the data. Before that, um, let me answer the questions about export. So the environments that we talked about, um, typically, again, 
it will be like a test in a typical uh, workflow like you know you have a set of services and you might have a test environment you might have a staging and you might want to have a production so for each uh, setups especially in a secure environment you can actually define acls saying that only developers can access uh, st staging only qe can access test cluster and only operations can deploy into production when you have that you can actually take the de application that you develop uh, use export so just download it and do an import application, right? Yeah, this is our exported version. And you can rename that, uh, keep that. Here, you can actually choose which environment you want to apply while re-importing. So you can actually go from testing it and actually staging so that you can sample the application itself, then actually brew into production. So that's... That's the uh, top. Um, that, that's the building the application itself. So far, any questions? I can quickly answer before I move on to dashboarding. Yeah. It's a popular question that we get. So, <laughs> so when we initially started off, we actually looked into Beam uh, at the stage. Uh, Beam doesn't have a tight integration to Spark, only Flink had, and their APIs were changing. So we actually added our own API and, uh, that can translate into different engines. Right now we are actually talking to Beam community itself, and they are very interested when we had this demo kind of uh, help us with translating that unified into Beam, which is actually easier for us because we don't want to sit there and write Flink, uh, Spark, or whatever, all, all the other integrations. It's easier for us to write Beam and you know there are already integrations with Beam into other engines, and it will easily give us into you know uh, Google engine as well. So, so it's a long term plan. To make it's not nearly. I wouldn't say long term, but kind of immediate or next immediate so kind of thing. Like I'd have to kind of take that into a Beam runner, okay. and from Beam runner you can actually deploy into whatever the engine that you choose to. So, um, I don't know if there is any data flowing through. So another, so yeah, yeah, so I think um, if I can talk about, uh, there is a sandbox, a chair sandbox, and I think there is an Amazon images as well that available you can just spin up. Um, sandbox is a VM, you can just install on a laptop and can play with this one. Uh, So, uh, so far what I've showed is kind of developer point of view. The other point is that operations. So we are exposing rich set of metrics in this view mode. Uh, you can actually set alerts kind of saying that if the failed tuples are increased X amount of time, send me a message. And there are rich tools to kind of go and debug, uh, you know, what's going on. We have a you know, site-wide uh, kind of a central search, log search. And you can take JSTAG, JVM, um, uh, yeah, you can take the, the worker uh, JSTACs kind of debug much more easily. And we are still continuing to invest into this page where we kind of allow users to kind of ingest their own metrics and custom metrics itself uh, can view this and put alerts on top of that. Not right now. Uh, what we have right now is the simple SDK. So what I showed you earlier is totally done with the built-in um, sources, process, and syncs. Uh, for example, you want to add your own business logic, right? Uh, you want to add your own integration. Uh, what we have is something called as custom processor. So these three here is our custom process, right? So this is done by the user itself. You can go to the application resources here and add your own custom process. This is like a uh, typical library development kind of thingy. So what user is doing here is actually extending our interface, building their own uh, logic itself, and defining what are the conflicts that they want to kind of ask users to input for them. 
So when you are configuring all these things, we are asking the UI, you know, this is my Zookeeper connection, this is my table, whatnot. So in this case, the, the user itself kind of asking, these are my required, and kind of defining the types. So once they put that in place, it will automatically and upload this. Go back here. So it it will appear under the process section, these three, right? So, and whatever they defined in the in the custom processor resources section, it will appear as whatever the type that they defined. For example, if it is a password, it will you know do the right thing in the UI, and if it is select box or whatnot, and you know it does the validation for you everything else. So it's uh, once you done this, like other users can get to use that as well. Application uh, resources. So custom process one way of extending this framework. Uh, we also have UDF, which is the you know aggregate stuff that you can build, and you can write your own functions there. So uh, this particular application actually doing a lot of things and actually pushing the data into Druid as well. So the other aspect of that is going to the dashboard. Once you go to the dashboard, you can actually go to the sources. So all the stuff that we are just done right now is actually appearing in the in the cubes, and the data that is with the Druid, uh, the underlying storage is here is a Druid. The good thing about the Druid is it's a really nice OLAP tool and really fast OLAP tool. That is, it uh, makes the data available in kind of immediately and can you can have the aggregation on the, the Druid side as well. So, and Superset allows you to kind of query that data and if, you know uh, build a dashboard so that you can actually showcase uh, what's going on in your application immediately. For example, if you want to kind of see what, if you're building a shopping uh, flow, for example, you want to see what are the, uh, products that are clicked in the last five minutes, and what are, how many of those products sold. So you can actually write those dashboards and expose that uh, from the superset itself. So that's, um, so we sh show you the developer side of the things, another thing is the operations, which is the view mode, with the metrics, rich metrics and everything, and then there is superset to analyze the data that is being processed in real time. So that's pretty much uh, about SAM. Again, um, it's, I don't think I'm running Fairly late to cover all the slides, uh, but the quickly to go over uh, the architecture. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, it runs under a JT container. Uh, you have a storage model similar to how schema registry will look like, and then there is environment service or the service pool service, um, and schema registry client. So all of them coming together. Here, the service pools, we are using Ambari. You can have a manual way of doing it. You can write, if you are using some other cluster manager tool, you can write uh, your own pluggable uh, service pool implementation. This is a pluggable interface itself, right? And once you have the SAM UI, you are kind of dragging and dropping, connecting those nodes. We are actually making calls to the web server, which is uh, creating a DAG on the back end. That's the Topology Action Services, creating the DAG. Uh, goes to the Topology DAG Builder, and that is the one who is responsible for handing it over all the spec that you built to the runner, right? The lifecycle manager is, you know, start, stop, kill, whatnot. That is the one. So it has a state uh, uh, management there. And once you build, once you hit the deploy, all the spec going and giving it to a runner. That is a configurable runner. Right now we did as a storm, which eventually convert into a storm flux and deploying into the storm uh, engine. Topology action, once we hit deploy, this is what's happening. Um, initial DAG gets constructed. Um, we get the artifacts, that is all the uh, connectors, sources process that you are getting up. And we also get the configs with that and get into deployed state. You know, if something happens, deployment fail comes back into the initial state and go through this process again. Um, I'll quickly go through this one, so the topology actions, you know, how it looks like before even going there, oh, SDK, again, this is how the custom process runtime looks like. There's a custom process that you're looking at the, on the toolbar that I showed you. Uh, simple interface, you have configs coming in in the initialize, and you're you know handing over every event that's coming in your way in the process method. 
you can return one or more events out of that. So I think I'll, so the current release so far is 05 that we just released, manual service pool registration, not requiring Ambari as a new mode. Test mode uh, that I didn't demo, I guess, today. Uh, the idea with the test mode is you develop this application. You don't want to, act, you don't require to deploy onto a cluster to see how it's working. So what in the test mode is we ask users to uh, give us like a sample of records and we kind of input that through all your flow and showcase how each event getting modified at each stage so that you can kind of have an idea how this particular flow will uh, behave if the data is, looks like this versus something else. Again, uh, we have a security, full security implementation uh, with RBAC uh, as well as permissions. You can have a fine-game controller and a lot of source, uh, all the process sensing that we shipped. Uh, in secure mode, we run this as a token-based authentication, so you don't have to kind of worry about shipping the key tabs or whatnot. Support for state management. Uh, if you want to have aggregate over a, you know, one hour or higher, you know, bigger windows, you can do so with that one state management shipped in. Uh, again, support for other streaming engine that we talked about earlier. It's open source under the Apache license. We are working on, again, Apache incubation. Um, go to that for the any questions. And again, if you are interested in contributing, please contact us. We'll be happy to help you. So that's pretty much it. Any questions? Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. So, yeah. So the question is, um, if you are developing a complex application, especially using aggregation, uh, you are deploying in two different clusters and you are seeing two different kind of outputs, could totally happen because of the you know window boundaries or whatnot. Uh, what we are trying to do is right now is what we have right now is sampling mechanism that kind of uh, gives you the data when you enable that from the UI itself, you can enable that, you know, you want to kind of show what is the aggregations happening at any, every window and sample that into disk as a file, right? So all of that can be viewed from the UI itself. So at every boundary, we kind of, in, you know, showcase what's the uh, data that's coming in. Uh, this is, again, if you're doing it in production, it will slow down, but in a developer staging, you will persist all this data um, neatly and kind of ordered and how the, uh, like, for example, in one window, you might be getting nine events versus another which having like a 20, right? So then you will know the difference. So those are the capabilities that we have right now. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the question is, how do you compare it to NiFi? So NiFi always has been a flow management. That is, you have a bunch of files in different locations, and you want to get to the messaging queue or HTTP as a hype. Uh, it's not for complex processing. That is, you know, you're not going to do a window processing or window aggregations. You're not going to do a filtering and all those stuff. You are saying is you have myriad different sources, and you want to get like a Twitter data, FTP, or whatnot. You want to get that data into Kafka analysis for further interesting processing. That's when you use NiFi versus a, a, this tool which allows you to kind of build a true streaming applications, a streaming analytics application, if I may, uh, to do windowing, you know, joining streams and filtering or whatnot. Flink. That's, again, uh, there is a lot of interest. Uh, <clears throat> we are actually talking to a couple of guys from, uh, I don't know if I can name the company, but they are a Flink committers. Uh, they are interested in contributing, so there is ongoing discussion right now. So if you go to, so under issues, there is already some discussion going on at the Flink. Let me see. Yeah, so you will find it somewhere here. So there is already a dis ongoing discussion going on. Uh, with a uh, few interested parties, and we have a Flink computer who is trying to help with us. 
uh, on this. Again, right now the discussion is should we go with a Beam root and let Beam deploy onto the Flink, uh, just run a native Flink integration. So we'll look at and kind of weigh the benefits versus one, one versus the other. The thing is, you know, there will be evolving, there will be another engine that's coming in who might be interested in as well. So we need to kind of figure out which way to go. I hope they are not closed. Yeah. Uh, right now, it is tightly integrated with SAM, uh, sorry, schema registry. The reason for that is uh, we want to kind of showcase the contextual schema within the UI itself. So that, for example, if you go to the window aggregate, uh, you kind of understand, uh, you know, the types of the, so all of this data is actually coming from the schema registry. So without that, we kind of, you know, doing that in a blind fashion, which we don't want to do that. So, you know, for you, it might be like a, having a converters on the schema registry and using that and using X into JSON or Avro format so that we can recognize that. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone.
Okay, folks, uh, thanks uh, for sticking around. Uh, so we have one last uh, short talk. Uh, this, this talk is going to sort of focus sort of a little bit more on the end-to-end -end, uh, building an application, going to focus a little bit more on the NiFi piece because there's some questions around NiFi. Uh, and it's actually a, a fully running end-to-end uh, -end streaming application. So at the end, you'll get a, a GitHub repo so that you can check it out yourself. So with that, uh, Edgar is our speaker. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so my name is Edgar. Uh, I study computer science. Uh, since last year, uh, I, I work on uh, developing applications with Apache, uh, Kafka, NiFi, Storm, Spark. Um, and I work with the uh, Sandbox team to develop an environment for deploying data applications, uh, with the uh, community team to develop document, uh, documentation and tutorials around uh, data applications to help developers get started. Um, so, um, so with that, um, just make sync. Uh, so we're going to be skipping over the demo portion today for this application, but you'll get, uh, there's a link at the end where you can go and, and uh, set up a demo yourself. Uh, it'll be everything you need, environment and code and everything. Um, so, um, but there are some screenshots, so just a heads up. Uh, so uh, there's, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of data, so, you know, especially with the emergence of the Internet of Things. Uh, if, if we're talking about four zettabytes today, we're talking about 44 zettabytes of data tomorrow. And um, with, with current approaches, if you, uh, if you were to look up, uh, if you were to look up reference applications online for you know, how to wrangle data and how to set up data applications, you'd get a lot of, a lot of lacking reference applications. Uh, so we're going to go over that in a bit, but I just want to keep this number um, sort of in the back of our minds. There's, there's obviously a lot of data and uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a streaming uh, influx to deal with. So, uh, so just to touch on uh, the modern use case that the you know, schema registry and SAM demos sort of follow today, just to give a bit, um, a bit more uh, depth to it. So there's this uh, vehicle dispatch company and they, they ship cargo across the United States. And you know, the cargo needs to be delivered to a location safely. Uh, and the cargo and you know, the drivers need to, be, uh, need to be safe. But a string of rec recent accidents have meant that insurance premiums have gone up. Uh, there have been more uh, service costs related to you know, keeping their infrastructure and their, their cars, or rather their vehicles uh, repaired. And so they need, to find the way to, they need to find a way to drive insurance premiums down while increasing their service. Uh, and you know, they have a hunch as to what they want to do, but company changes shouldn't be driven by hunches, they should be driven by real actionable data. And so uh, the solution would be to leverage actual data, you know, real life data coming from you know, their trucks or their drivers. And so what that means is uh, install, se install sensors on trucks. Uh, you want to be able to perform some analytical processing uh, to, you know, to figure out uh, if, uh, you know, what actions need to be taken on a driver or on a truck. That's, per, uh, that's uh, prescriptive analysis, but you'll also want to do predictive analysis so that you can, you know, stop these accidents from happening in the first place. And for that, you want some, uh, you want to be able to leverage not just real-time data, but also historical data. You know, whether you, know, you process real-time data and then you persist it in some sort of like data store or, da you know, in a data or whatnot. Um, and one of the most important things which we're going to talk about today is there are, there are, you know, you may have hundreds or thousands of trucks and you may have sensors and you might have uh, data, you might have like influx from, uh, from you know, third party syndicated sources or, or whatever it may, you know, whatever you may have. It's, it's not just like data from point A to point B. Um, so. So we touched on this before, but the existing resources for, uh, for modern data uh, uh, application, they're sort of lacking. Like if you, if you, it seems like everybody's doing the same things. It's like sentiment analysis on Facebook feeds or like word count on Twitter feeds. And that's all great and stuff. And that's like a great example of how to do something very, very specific with a very, very specific component. But what about the stuff that like actually matters, like our day jobs, right? Like genomics researchers uh, are, are pulling in data from hundreds of, oh, Mike. <laughs> Sorry, I was wondering what was going on. So, uh, uh, so um, yeah, so researchers pull in data from, you know, a number of sources, and they need to process, and they need to, they need to route the flows, 
And uh, it's not as simple as taking data from, from point A, uh, you know, processing it with you know, your favorite stream processing engine and then dumping it into point B. Like, it gets really complicated. Data is, is broken, and that, you know, uh, especially now, data is, is incomplete, and that's becoming the norm, not the exception. There's a lot of heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity uh, that we have to account for. Uh, and so, wow, I'll skip a couple things, sorry. I'm just trying to get the beef of things here. But, uh, so, uh, w with that, wouldn't it be awesome if there was a reference application that was not only built on true open source uh, platforms, but that was fully sourced and supported. So instead of going and like looking up a tutorial or like reference application for each individual component to leverage in your data, uh, in, a, in a modern data architecture, there would be like one sample application that would have like everything covered and it is like fully supported, uh, you know, followed a single use case end to end. So you weren't, uh, you weren't worried about like what component uh, uh, whether that would break if you, you know, incorporated different up and downstream services with it. Best practices and evolved over the lifetime um, of the, uh, evolved with the evolution of the different services that it leverages rather than it being outdated in like two and a half years. So uh, that, okay. so just a quick architectural overview of, of the application that you'll be able to on uh, you'll have the sources for. Uh, we have the internet of, uh, of anything, right? Anything and everything. And in this case, if you follow in our use case, it is data from truck sensors as well as data from uh, some arbitrary online service that delivers, uh, uh, that delivers data on traffic congestion. So what we're going to do is we're going to use NiFi. We're going to get into that in a second. I'm really super, I'm, NiFi is awesome. We're going to get into that in a second. Uh, NiFi is going to be our data flow manager. Uh, and we're going to route data to a message broker. In this case, we're going to be using Kafka. We're going to build an application using Streaming Analytics Manager. We're going to persist in a Druid store. And then we're going to use Superset uh, to do some OLAP, or, you know, analytical processing, some visualization of the data. Uh, we're going to skip this portion down here. Uh, and uh, schema registry, we'll, we can sort of, we'll, we'll talk about how that integrates with the application. Uh, also, so just a, For sure. Uh, and so, um, uh, so just a quick heads up. There's a, there's a Bitlink on the bottom, and uh, that link will take you directly to a tutorial uh, that covers how you can build this entire thing uh, using completely open source platform. All the code is available online, so check that out. It's hosted on uh, Hortonworks site. So, so uh, Apache NiFi. So, uh, that a lot of uh, you know it's difficult. Uh, it's rather, it's not trivial to route data. You have point A, uh, you know, data from point A that needs to be dropped in point B. Really what it looks like is, and you need to filter out the bad data. You have to transform some of the, you know, some of the good data, massage it into a format that you want, and then dump it, or rather route it uh, to a system, you know, that, that you need to leverage. That's what Apache NiFi um, is fantastic for. Uh, it, it's, uh, it uses a visual flow, um, or rather, it's a, a visual sort of drag and drop paradigm. Um, and uh, what, here, let's uh, yeah. So this is a, this is an ex a screenshot of what NiFi looks like, and this is a very simple flow. So the specifics are, are not very important. But what I want to point out is sort of how uh, easy of a flow using Apache uh, NiFi um, looks. So you have, you, know, you have a few processors and you route it to an, a, a, another processor. Uh, NiFi calls any sort of uh, processing unit, or, you know, flow unit, if you will, uh, a processor. So we route data, you know, and we have sort of different sort of uh, pit stops, sort of uh, filtering logic, if you will, to route the data to where it needs to go. And so it doesn't matter if you're doing something super simple, like you have two endpoints, uh, rather, two uh, 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 sort of two influxes of data and then one endpoint, or if you have something complex like this monster right here, uh, you know, NiFi uh, will help you do this visually using a drag and drop paradigm, rather than having to code this thing, you know, whatever and whatever method we typically code, which you know, of course, of course, 
it differs from uh, company to company. Uh, so uh, NiFi is a fantastic uh, f uh, flow manager. Uh, so schema registry, uh, so we, we talked about schema registry, but what I want to focus on is how it integrates with services like NiFi. Uh, in, a, in a data application, you need to know the data that's coming in, the format that the data is in, and where the data is where the data is going. Uh, but um, uh, you, the, the thing is, you have to do this in every service and each stage of your pipeline, and it's difficult to uh, it's difficult to make sure that the data and the format's consistent. So for that, you know, most of us leverage, uh, you know, most of us utilize schemas, and we make sure that our data adheres to this schema. Uh, any engineer here knows that uh, schema uh, and scope uh, changes as your application evolves, and if you have if you have brittle schema, then you have a brittle application. And if you have a brittle application, then things fail. And so uh, this is where schema registry comes into play. So the way schema registry integrates with NiFi is, uh, so NiFi is, um, uh, it's data agnostic. Uh, and so you can, you can take you know, data from you know, any source and massage it in the way that you need to to dump it to any end, end point. But rather than having to worry about matching those impedances yourself between, uh, you know, between, uh, node to node, you can have NiFi do that for you. So NiFi integrates with Schema Registry, and if you have data coming in in format X, and it needs to be sort of a, you know, massaged, if you will, or filtered to, to you know, working with, or being rather being compatible with you know, a certain node, uh, then have, then NiFi integrates with Schema Registry, and it can sort of, it could handle those, it can match those impedances for you. It massages the format, if you will. If you're familiar with, is, with schemas, then you, know, you understand exactly how that works. But uh, if you're not, then it, uh, it makes sure that uh, you don't have to re-architect uh, any one stage of your pipeline or one, any, any you know, one application uh, to, you know, to fit with how up or downstream services have changed data or expected data to be. Um, so let's... Uh, so just, I just want to touch on this third point here. So we, uh, you know, not using Streaming Analytics Manager or some application that builds, uh, rather not using a service that builds applications using a visual dra drag and drop paradigm means there's usually typically a lot of like low level coding. Uh, whether you're using Storm, Spark, Flink, more, more Kafka, like Kafka streams or Aqua streams, it doesn't matter. Usually there's like low level coding involved. And if you, if you can't, if the documentation doesn't help you out, then you better know how to dig into the internals and you know, figure this stuff out using the source code itself. Uh, depending on the platform that you're leveraging, there's also a lot of boilerplate and dependency issues. I've had, there's like, you know, palm file nightmares that I think a lot of us have dealt with. Um, and the development cycle is not always fun. And, you know, it's sort of a very manual, very long process. Uh, and so that is where uh, Streaming Analytics Manager comes in and makes this process much simpler. And if you check out the, uh, if you check out the tutorial, uh, the link on the bottom, or uh, the repository that, we're, that we'll share at the end, we have examples for how to achieve a, a, data, uh, a modern data application with Storm, Flink, um, this is Spark Streaming, uh, and you, you'll see the differences if you try to implement those yourselves versus leveraging streaming and, uh, uh, versus, versus uh, uh, leveraging SAM to, to get that built out for you. So, um, so let's see if we have, uh, we're going to skip the web application, but let's see here. Uh, no screenshot. So, So, uh, so yeah. So skipping over Streaming Analytics Manager because that was already demoed earlier today. Uh, the next step of the the next step of the, the the pipeline would be to analytics on on your data, and so uh, Sam uh, would uh, would persist the data in some data store. In our demo, we're we're going to store that in a Druid data store, which is a high performance data store. A lot for like OLAP and analytics. But you'll want you'll want some sort of like front end, some visual front end, especially for like the business folk. If you're a developer, then you know you typically find that your boss needs some sort of like visualization or something like more tangible. So this is where Superset comes in. 
Uh, so at its core, it's a data exploration platform. Uh, it's used for creating visualizations and, and running analytics. It was originally uh, developed by, uh, by engineers at Airbnb, uh, but since then, uh, Hortonworks engineers have uh, hopped on it. And so I think uh, as far as like Apache committers goes, it's like, it's like six Hortonworks engineers and horn workers and uh, like five Air, uh, Airbnb engineers uh, last time I checked. Um, so let's see, I think I've got a screenshot, fantastic. Uh, so just like a, a screenshot of what you'll find in the repository that you can check out. This is sort of, this is uh, just, uh, these are two uh, slices, right? These like different visualizations, superset cosm slices, just two of the slices that you'll find in the repository. Um, and so, uh, to give you a bit of uh, background, Superset is pulling in and uh, processing uh, data from Druid in real time or near real time, depending on exactly what your flow looks like. And, it, and, you know, and it'll update as frequently as you need to or again in real time. So these visualizations you'll find are actually being uh, rendered in real time using real time data that is being f uh, filtered and intelligently routed uh, by NiFi. So, uh, so just to recap how the architecture looks like, we have the Internet of Things, which in our case are, is a data from trucks, uh, truck sensors, and uh, traffic congestion information. We intelligently get it through NiFi. Uh, we filter out the bad data, the data that we want, we send it to where we need to be, uh, which in this case is uh, you know, our message broker, Kafka. We Kafka, we consume it with an application that we build with Streaming Analytics Manager. It gets persisted to a by Superset. And again, uh, Schema Registry integrates, or rather NiFi, Kafka, and SAM integrate with Schema Registry so you don't have to match and you don't have to worry about uh, you know, uh, whether uh, an update to one service or one application means having to go through your entire pipeline and make uh, necessary changes to, to, to everything else. Especially if you're working on an end-to-end -end pipeline and you have a lot of services, then you find that you know, one small update may mean having to make a bunch of small updates to everything else. So, so using schema registry helps you, uh, uh, helps you not necessarily avoid that problem, but having this sort of done for you automatically uh, you, you know, in, in a way that's very, very manageable. Uh, so some of the typical challenges that come up uh, with just developing in general are are um, are made sort of are, are made easier by leveraging like schema registry and SAM. With schema registry, you don't have to worry about you know uh, uh, you don't have to worry about the issues with scheme. With SAM, you don't have to worry about super low level coding. Uh, you can build, you have this unifying abstraction layer so you can build an application with any stream processing engine as your backend. Um, and, um, uh, but you'll find that especially you know, in early development, you, uh, you have this really long cycle. And so one, sort of one better approach to you know, sitting there and recompiling and deploying to your cluster is setting up an, uh, sort of uh, an automation server. Uh, but even that can be tedious. You know, you, if you want to amortize, uh, you may not necessarily want to do that early on if you kind of want to move fast and, and be agile. Uh, you don't want to necessarily deploy a new, pr uh, a new cr uh, cluster each time because that can be expensive. So uh, one, one, uh, a better approach would be to use a containerized environment. Uh, and in our case, we leverage uh, so Hornwork Sandbox. Uh, so it's a pre-built, sort of pre-optimized environment that you can just you know, throw onto your machine, whether it be Docker, uh, VMware, VirtualBox, and you've got a cluster ready to go, ready to deploy uh, different, you know, whatever data applications you may need. And the best part about it is it, uh, there are a lot of tutorials and sample data applications written to run on the sandbox that you could actually walk through and, and have code for. and. Um, and it's uh, good, good stuff. So as far as the, I know we couldn't walk through any of the code and we didn't have time to go through a demo, but uh, in case you're interested, uh, with the link that'll, uh, uh, in the repo that we'll share next slide, uh, some of the other things that are being brought to this demo are um, uh, predictive analytics using machine learning with Spark. Um, uh, there is, uh, you know, there's, uh, Kerberos support for you know SAM schema registry and not but uh, and whatnot but as far as demoing this in an entire end-to-end -end, 
uh, modern data architectural uh, perspective. Uh, we're working on getting that as, uh, into part of the repo as well. And there are already tons of code and documentation to check out whether or not you want to uh, 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 you know, publish data to Kafka from NiFi or maybe a storm application or uh, you know, just some third party application you've got somewhere in your cluster uh, so that you wanna make it, uh, you wanna have it integrated with schema registry or you want it to work with SAM. Uh, there are a bunch of code and documentation uh, to check out, whatever sort of your use case may be. And if you find something that's not on there, you could, you know, you can uh, ping me and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get something documented. Um, so with that, just a couple links. Yep, just a couple links. Uh, so again, the link on the bottom is for a walkthrough on how to actually get everything set up using the Hornworks uh, Dataflow sandbox. The, the code and documentation that I was referring to, you can find using this link on the top. And if you want to check out other tutorials, sort of other walkthroughs, very depth, not just on uh, SAM and Schema Registry, but also on Bari, Kafka, Spark Streaming, et cetera, you can check out this middle link. Uh, tons of tutorials, and uh, there's fantastic support uh, by Hornworks behind each one of these, uh, each one of the tutorials that you'll find on there. Yeah, so with that, uh, that's, that's, that's uh, the. Uh, yeah, I'm sending you your slides for another Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, of Sam? Oh, this one, yep. Yeah. Yeah, oh, great question. So just to, uh, in, uh, just to uh, uh, so the question was, when using NiFi, are there, is there a requirement as to like where the data is either coming from or where it's being persisted? Do you have to, does it have to stay within HDF or can you use like a data platform like Hornworks like, or like the HDP? Uh, no, so NiFi is super, super versatile. Um, you, can, you can pull data from really any number of data sources, whether those data sources be part of the HDF platform or somewhere out in the web, some like third party. Uh, and you can also persist anywhere. So whether you want to persist to Hadoop, whether it's on like a, you know, an, a Horworks platform or just some, you know, a Hadoop uh, you know, a cluster you have somewhere else or you know, even like your local file system. Yeah, NiFi will help route it to wherever you need. So there's no like a requirement rather in that regard. Yeah, for sure. Fantastic question. So the question was, if if you're using any of these uh, any of these services for production, are there any fees uh, attached to them? And so every single one of these is open source. So as far as just like downloading the service off the web, like the binaries and throwing them into your your uh, into like your yeah, your your pipeline, yeah, everything here is 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 open source. There's no fees attached to it. Uh, you know, as far as like using them goes. Yeah, yeah. Production environment. Uh, production environment, yeah. So I mean, these are all open source. You could play with them, and you know, whether it be development or you throw them on production. As far as like, yeah, usage goes, yeah, completely free open source. Yeah, great question. Uh, yes, sir. Stream table joints. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, so you can, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure if the demo earlier went over joining streams, but. Right, like as far as, yeah, as far as like merging streams and joining streams off of different criteria, there's absolutely support for that. It's one of like the native um, processors, but I'm not sure if I'm understanding. But what about a stream to a table joint? The table's not to stream. Right. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't, I can't speak to that. I'm not quite sure. So the question was if Sam has support for, uh, for joining table streams. And there's definitely support for joining streams and, and really any data from any source that, uh, that Sam you know, uh, can, you know, yeah. that Sam reads yeah. from. But.
have data on this that you're persisting, and you might want to look at what they might do. And you can add it. Well, I'm saying like one's a stream and one's a table, and you want to use the table to enrich the stream. Well, like in a look of table. Yeah, look of table. Right. That's what I'm talking about. So, you just write a, you write a, a single uh, connector on the data. Right. So, so just to reiterate for the for the folks watching on the live stream, the question was uh, if you can if you can join data from uh, from from a t table, and what you'd want to do is you know whether the data is at rest or not at, at rest, you want to take it and you want to stream it into SAM in this case, and then you can operate on the data as you know uh, per usual. Uh, so even if the data is at rest, you 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 know you take it, you uh, you ingest it, and then you stream it into whatever system. Yeah, into, into Sam, rather. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thanks, folks, for coming out to another Future Data Meetup. We're entering the, the summer season. It's clearly uh, hot enough. So uh, I'm not sure if we're going to have a meetup in July, but maybe late July or early August we'll look to have our, our next meetup. So in, in, our next, in, in this next upcoming meet, we want to kind of switch it a little bit and maybe try to get some hands-on. So get you hands-on with Sam and hands-on with NiFi and kind of put, it, put this all together. So uh, keep an eye out for, for, for that meetup in, in the future. So thank you and uh, have a good weekend.